The Churchill Center is a global organization educating new generations on the leadership, statesmanship, vision, and courage of Winston Churchill. The center is partnering with the George Washington University to create the new National Churchill Library and Center in the heart of Washington. The facility will be at the university's Gelman Library and will include a library of books written by and about Churchill, rotating exhibits, and space for seminars. An endowed professorship in Churchill and British Studies will also be created as part of this partnership. Winston Churchill once wrote that the stomach governs the world. In addition to being a great statesman, Churchill was known to enjoy the best food, drink, and cigars. But for him, the most important part of any meal was the conversation. Churchill was a master at using the occasion of meals to charm and persuade his guests, and he deployed those skills at dinners with Roosevelt, Stalin, and others to shape world events. Author Sita Stelzer has written a book about Winston Churchill and his dinner party diplomacy. It's called Dinner with Churchill, and she joins me in the studio. Sita, welcome. Thank you. So, Sita, set the stage for us. What would dinner with Churchill would have been like? Well, you used exactly the right words, uh, set the stage. Uh, a dinner with Churchill uh, would have been one of two kinds, a grand occasion with Presidents Roosevelt or Truman, or it could have been uh, friends, 10 or uh, 12 people, at one of the London hotels when he was out of office. Uh, if you can give you an example of a dinner, let's say at Chequers, uh, the Prime Minister's country house during the war, it would have started off um, with champagne uh, in, the, in the grand drawing room at Chequers. And that would have lasted a half hour. And then dinner would be sort of 9 to um, 10, 10.30. The ladies would have been excused, uh, as it was then, even then, during the war. And the men would have stayed behind to smoke cigars for another 20 minutes. Uh, conversation uh, was not confined to just when the men were smoking cigars. A political conversation would have been throughout dinner. And then they would, the men would rejoin the ladies, um, and there would be a movie shown. This is on uh, work nights during the war. The movie would have lasted till 11, 30, 12 o'clock, at which point Churchill would stand up, Prime Minister Churchill would stand up and say, uh, now to work. And he and his generals and politicians who were at the dinner would go into the dens and work until two or three in the morning. But he always took a nap, so he was okay with staying up late. He did take a nap every day. He got uh, undressed and into bed under the covers. Uh, so he, that is what allowed him to go on until three o'clock in the morning. But not everybody could do that. Very few people, very few generals and admirals and uh, any of the staff people could have done that. I, I don't know how many of them got through with that kind of exhaustion, but they did. Why do you think it's important to know about Churchill's dinner diplomacy? A lot of things, uh, dinner was not just a social occasion. Dinner was uh, an opportunity for Churchill to, as you said, uh, to, to learn things. For instance, it was not a 24-hour news cycle in those days. So the best way to find out information from, say, the Soviet Union would have been to invite the American ambassador uh, who had just been in, in the Soviet Union and had sat down with Stalin. So he, Churchill would always include people who had up-to-date information at his dinners. It was a way of gathering data that he couldn't ordinarily get. And also he used those dinners uh, to persuade people at um, the other side of the table of his policies to get uh, to try to talk them into to agreeing with him. And he um, was quite persuasive, quite charming. He was very persuasive. He was very charming, as you say, and he was very funny. Um, so that there were um, one of the reasons I have a whole book about dinner with Churchill is because so many people were entertained uh, at, at his dinners. They all wrote about it. The There's diaries. so much information out there about those dinners. That's right, because people wanted to remember his stories and his arguments and his persuasions, and they wrote it. They wrote them in journals and letters back to family and they um, and diaries. Do you think that he cared about the food itself so much, or I mean, did he did he set the menu? Did he say this is what we're going to be eating at this dinner, or was it more the conversation and the people? Well, the, uh, 
he did he did care about what was served and he cared about how it was prepared. Uh, but at the end of the day, it was the conversation. You're quite right; it was the conversation. But the food, what Churchill liked to eat, was slightly different from our impression of what a Edwardian grand British Tory would have liked. Uh, Churchill liked pr plain, simple, perfectly cooked food. No French sauces, no concoctions, no fancy pies, uh, no fancy desserts. Uh, and when Churchill was in charge of the menu, yes, in fact, he, he um, set the menu. At one dinner that he was giving um, for the king and queen, Churchill started to amend the menu. And, and Lady Churchill at that point f said he couldn't do it. It was too late. But he was tinkering with the stage that he wanted to be on. And ham always had to be served with mustard. Yes. <laughs> so yes. he was picky. He was very picky. <laughs> the book we're discussing is called Dinner with Churchill, Policymaking at the Dinner Table. Author Sita Stelzer is in the studio with me. She's a freelance journalist and research associate at the Hudson Institute. What do you think sets Churchill apart, just in the, in the general sense, from other world leaders? Well, I think um, two things, really. I think what made him uh, different from other people, uh, maybe three things. The first one, I think, is his foresight. I mean, he, uh, in the early, in the beginning in the early third, 1930s, he started to, to see that the Germans were building up a navy and a military structure that would someday um, be a threat to Great Britain. And he was in the wilderness, but he was able to get information from people who were still in the government and, and friends and relations who were in Germany so that he could document the fact that Germany was moving towards war with Great Britain. And then, of course, um, he was absolutely right. That is what happened. But he saw it coming very early. And the second part of his foresight was really almost from the day after victory in Europe, Churchill started to worry about Stalin and communism. He knew where... And he was right about that, too. He was right about that, too. And he was worried that about the, the, the Cold War. I mean, it hadn't started in, in 1945, but he knew that the, the communist forces on the ground would be able to dictate the future structure of Europe. So after Pearl Harbor, uh, Churchill insists on going to the White House mm -hmm. personally and staying there yes. with FDR. What was he trying to do? Well, as soon as he um, heard about Pearl Harbor, he jumped up from the dinner table at Checkers and said, I'm going to Washington. It was instantaneous. Um, much like Tony Blair said when uh, he heard about September 11th. And Churchill, uh, at great personal risk, got in a Navy ship and crossed the Atl North Atlantic when there were U-boats everywhere and got to the White House and moved in. He moved into the Lincoln bedroom. Um, and for three weeks. For three weeks. Over Christmas. Over Christmas. And the, the staff at the White House had no idea. They knew somebody was coming for dinner, but they didn't know that it was going to be Prime Minister of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, Winston Churchill, and 30 or 40 of his staff. But he really wanted to convince FDR Forget about Asia for now. Let's work on Europe first. Exactly right. Even and though it was Japan that attacked us. That's right. But the, I think that to President Roosevelt's credit, he understood that if he didn't fight Hitler in Europe, that a, a, a Europe and Great Britain under fascism would have been a much more difficult problem, especially uh, if Japan had taken over in Southeast Asia. And he did accomplish that. He did accomplish that. And he set up, that was the primary accomplishment. And he also, they set up a combined chiefs of staff, which is very unusual. That means that the three services, the Army and the Navy and the Air Force, the generals of each of those and their staffs would work side by side. There would be no military secrets or strategies uh, that weren't shared by these two countries. Very, very unusual. Never been done before. So was he happy with the food at the White House? He hated food at the White House. <laughs> Everybody hated the food at the White House except Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, Mrs. Henrietta Nesbitt strikes fear into the heart of anybody who's read any history about uh, Roosevelt's White House. She cooked boiled broccoli, cr 
cream chip on the cream beef on chip beef or something on with mushrooms on toast, uh, Bavarian cream pie. It, it, they're dated foods, but not only do they sound silly to us, but they were badly prepared. And she served leftovers. Uh, which she served chicken a la king three times a week, and the president, President Roosevelt, hated it. But Churchill didn't complain because he was there to to woo President Roosevelt, so he didn't he didn't say anything. Sita Stelzer is in the studio with me. She's the author of Dinner with Churchill: Policy Making at the Dinner Table. Well, a lot's been made of Churchill's drinking. <laughs> was he an alcoholic? I don't think he was an alcoholic. Uh, I've read really hundreds and hundreds of uh, diaries and reports and journals about what it was like to have dinner with Churchill, to be around Churchill uh, day in and day out. And there are, there are really no, um, there are only two people who mentioned that Churchill was drunk. One of those was a staff person who was reporting uh, uh, to Stalin, thinking this is what Stalin would have liked him to know. The other was an, uh, was an aide to Anthony Eden, and certainly that aide would have would like would have thought that his boss wanted to know that Churchill was drunk. Um, nobody else said he was drunk. Now he did drink a lot by our standards today. I mean, it it sounds a lot. Half a bottle of champagne, which is slightly smaller than our half bottles today, at lunch, one or two brandies after dinner. That's a lot. Um, and then the same thing again at, at at dinner. But he could not have worked so many years, so successfully, prosecuted the war to, to victory if he'd been incapacitated by alcohol. And he also, remember, he, he liked the myth that he drank a lot. Churchill liked the idea that he was one of the people, that he could go down to the pub and have a drink with the guys. Um, he, he certainly didn't hide it. He, he, he talked and joked about his drinking. And there's that ever-present cigar. <laughs> he loved cigars, right from very early on, um, he, he used them for three purposes, really. He loved the, the, it's the sheer pleasure and f- flavor of cigar. The other is he, he was such a good politician that he could use a cigar as a trademark, like Roosevelt used his jaunty ho- cig- cigarette and holder up like this, sort of optimistic and smiling. And Churchill knew that the cigar was an emblem that the people would use to identify him. Um, but in what way? I mean, was it that he's so confident we're going to win the war that he can just light up a cigar? Well, was that it? I think he had a lit cigar with him all the time. And he certainly, when he went out during the Blitz, which he did very often into neighborhoods, he would hold up his cigar uh, and people could see that it was him. Remember that. I mean, he wasn't standing on a, on a podium or anything. He was walking the streets. They could see that it was Churchill and the cigar. And also he, he used the cigar... Um, at a dinner to extend the meal because he didn't want it didn't want people to disperse he wanted them to stay together so he would have all the rituals of lighting a cigar with the special matches and drawing it out he lived to 90 years old i mean this man (laughs) smoked and drank and ate whatever he wanted and traveled how how he must have had good genes although we don't know because his father died early um he must have, he did not really have any serious illnesses. He had uh, pneumonia in the middle of the war, but I mean, he was in bed for three days with a temperature, and then it was gone. I mean, it was, And he had a stroke, though, as well. He had several, yes. And he had, uh, but there were no serious, I don't know what you call it medically, there were no other kinds of diseases. Uh, he was just plain lucky. So during the war, food was rationed in Britain. Did that affect Churchill and the dinners that he gave? Um, Churchill was was very worried about rationing. He was worried about how it would affect the people in terms of their energy levels, their morale. And he didn't want to allow the people to think that he was not um, playing by the same rationing rules that they were subjected to. The book we're discussing is called Dinner with Churchill, Policy Making at the Dinner Table. Author Sita Stelzer is in the studio with me. Let's talk about the big three conferences. Um, what was the purpose of those conferences? Well, it, the, the big three, uh, the Grand Alliance, the basic purpose of, of them is for Churchill to get to know the people opposite him. They were allies, but he wanted to get to know them. He also wanted his staff 
to get to know the staffs of the other two. Um, so this was Churchill's idea to come together? as a He believed face-to-face conferences were the way to get ahead. And uh, uh, people agreed with him. I mean, certainly President Roosevelt wanted to go in Tehran and meet with Stalin. He had not met him before, and he wanted to make sure that Stalin understood that, that Roosevelt's great idea for the United Nations was what Roosevelt was interested in. And Stalin had his own purposes, of course. Um, as we know from the structure of Europe after the war, those are his purposes. So the tradition was that each leader would host a dinner. Mm-hmm. How did that work? Well, it set up, it, it was sort of a tradition that started. Um, when Churchill was first in the White House, he didn't have his own dinners, but when they were on neutral territory, then they would set up and would say, okay, my dinner is the first night and your dinner is the second night. In Tehran, um, it was interesting because Churchill said, right, I'm the oldest, it's my birthday, and so I'm going to have the dinner on that day. And everybody had to agree. Uh, but then it was, you know, the three, the big three would have these dinners, and there would be maybe as many as 20, 15 to 20 of the staff in the room. And then the staffs, the other staff that were left over would be having their own dinners elsewhere. And that's where serious work was done. That's why these were so important. So how did Churchill's dinner compare with the other two? Well, if you take Tehran, um, I think that was a very interesting dinner because it was his birthday and he insisted on having a birthday cake. Now, you know, you do think of children sort of up to the age of 10 maybe insisting on a birthday cake and candles, but Churchill, the prime minister, wanted a birthday cake. And he was 69. And he was 69 and he got a cake and he blew out the candles on the sideboard in the British Embassy in Tehran, uh, those uh, tables are still in the dining room in the British Embassy in Tehran today. Um, he was he was so he was so human, Churchill. Uh, he he was just at ease with himself, so that he could insist on having a birthday cake, um, and nobody minded. But Stalin didn't speak English, so Correct. he always had an interpreter with him. Correct. I mean, was Churchill able able to kind of break the ice with Stalin? Did even with an interpreter? You mean? I, there are some people who said that Stalin understood a little more English than he ever let on. He certainly couldn't speak it, but he understood. And at one point he said to Churchill, I don't know what you're saying, but I like your spirit. So that there's communication that's not just in language. But did they get along? I think they got, in the beginning, Churchill tried very hard to keep this new ally happy. Uh, it was very difficult because Stalin was insisting on a second front in 1942, and there was no way that the Anglo-American alliance could, could provide that. And so Churchill had to go and face the bear in his lair and say, I'm sorry, we can't do this, but we still need you as an ally, and try to, um, again, like he did with Roosevelt, to woo Stalin, which he did, and successfully, because in that meeting in 42, Stalin agreed that, in fact, a second front would have been premature. The meeting at Potsdam, this is now with Truman, Churchill actually did the seating arrangements himself for his dinner, which I find incredible because I don't see an American president ever doing the seating arrangement for a dinner. I don't think anybody ever did except Churchill. Uh, It just shows his attention to detail. Um, he He did it for all the dinner, all the big dinners. Churchill also placed the interpreters. Do you want the interpreters to sit next to a person or slightly behind? Churchill wanted, he sat, Churchill sat in the middle of a table, never at the head, and he put Stalin and Roosevelt on either side of him. But Roosevelt on his right. Yeah, right. Good. <laughs> yes, exactly right. But the interpreters slightly behind. So you see, Churchill was always managing the event so that it would come out the way he wanted but what was his strategy with the seating? I mean, always the one that he wanted to honor the most on his right. What about who would sit in front of him? Uh, across the table. Uh, that's a good question. Because when he had Roosevelt and Stalin on either side, he would put the three foreign ministers opposite each other on the other side. So they could talk to each other. But Churchill was going to talk to the two other big twos. He wasn't going to share them with anybody else. And it is unusual that he did the seating and amended menus. 
The book we're discussing is called Dinner with Churchill, Policy Making at the Dinner Table. Sita Stelzer is in the studio with me. She's an author, freelance journalist, and research associate at the Hudson Institute. Well, two months after the Yalta conference, FDR dies, Truman does uh, come to office. Truman and FDR are very different people. Mm-hmm. How did Churchill and Truman get along? Um, there's, the first thing that Churchill did um, was to send Truman a note, sort of welcoming him into this grand alliance. Uh, Truman was not prepared for, for all of this, but uh, I think from the letters, not from the official diary and, and, and biographies of Truman, that Truman was a little cautious with Churchill's enthusiasm and exuberance and, and brio. And, and Truman was very careful and smart and wise in, in holding back a little bit. But then when Truman arrived there, um, he succumbed, like everybody does, to Churchill's charm. Um, Churchill was very worried about his first meeting with Truman, but it went very well. Of course it would have, because Churchill was Churchill. And going back to the relationship with Stalin, I thought it was interesting that Churchill once said that if I could have lunch with Stalin every week, things would be different or something like that. Right, right. If I could dine with Stalin once a week, there would be no trouble at all. Now, he said Very that. Very confident. Well, he, yes, he was supremely confident um, and with reason. But he said that in, in, uh, on the beach in uh, Normandy in 44 after the invasion. He said it to General Montgomery. So he was, all, he was still, even after victory was pretty sure, he was still thinking how he was going to stay in touch with Stalin and continue this relationship because uh, he was worried about it. So what was his vision for the post-war world? Churchill believed in, in uh, like Roosevelt did, in some sort of United Nations. He was worried that, uh, he was very worried about Stalin um, and the, what turned out to be the Eastern Bloc, the Warsaw Pact. But there was nothing he could do about that because Stalin was, in fact, he had boots on the ground. I mean, it was, there was nothing that could be done. There was no way that the Anglo-Americans could uh, have a new army and, and have another war. It was not possible. So he had to uh, make do. So Churchill later um, arranges a conference at Bermuda. This is now during the Eisenhower administration. What was his purpose? What, what was his aim to put a, put a conference together? Well, that was in, in 43. And in 1945, uh, Churchill, as I said, started to worry about the, the communist problem in Eastern Europe. And with Stalin dead in, in, in early 40, 53, Churchill felt that he could uh, make some headway if, in fact, President Eisenhower and Churchill would go and meet with the Russians. Now, Eisenhower, for a variety of reasons, was having none of this. But Churchill did get him to agree to a summit meeting in Bermuda. But the Soviets were not involved in that. Soviets were not because Eisenhower didn't agree that they would be invited. He did agree for some reason that nobody can figure out today to invite the French. Um, The French president at, at that moment landed in Bermuda got sick and stayed in bed the whole three days, so there was nothing to do there. Uh, But it was, sadly, uh, one of Churchill's failures. Um, He did not get Eisenhower to agree to go to Moscow or to invite the Russians to come to Washington for another big three summit. It might have helped. It might not have. I think the Soviets were in such flux then anyway, after the death of Stalin, that it might not have helped. Why do you think he failed? I think it's always better to have a conversation with uh, an enemy or a perceived enemy. Uh, It would have helped, it might have helped, if the Russian leadership then had come to Washington to meet with Eisenhower and Churchill, or if Churchill and Eisenhower had agreed to go to Moscow again. Uh, Certainly Eisenhower knew all the players. He knew what he was up against with the Russians. it's probably why he didn't want to go, but it might have helped. We don't know. So, Sina, how did um, Churchill deal with defeat and failure in general? He had his, what he calls his black dog, his depression. That uh, has now been tracked to mostly when he had no work to do. So uh, 
as soon as he got work to do, that disappeared, although he did have a family history of some depression, but it, it never really affected his, his work. Um, w- he dealt with defeat by getting up and trying again. That's what he did. He kept Just never give up. Never, 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 never give up. And he kept trying to get a summit meeting. When Eisenhower said no, he, t- say, he himself said, well, I'll go to Moscow. Um, I mean, he didn't, but um, he just kept trying. Well, let's circle back to the food now. Since we started this with the dinner table diplomacy, what would you say was Churchill's favorite food? Oh, he liked, uh, if I'm designing a meal to serve to him that would make him happy, I would serve him clear consomme. No, he, for some reason, he hated cream soups. I mean, he would fuss about them all the time. At the White House, he would not eat clam chowder at one of the dinners. So I would give him a clear consomme, and then I would give him um, a underdone or, or, or medium rare, perfectly cooked chicken or a game, goose or venison. Uh, he raised geese at his farm in, in Chartwell, and um, at one point, the goose was put in front of him to carve, and he said, he looked at it, and he said, I can't carve this, Clemmy, you'll have to. This goose was a friend of mine. <laughs> so maybe I <laughs> wouldn't have given him But he ate it anyway. But he ate, but he ate it. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and then I would give him his favorite, which is ice cream uh, with chocolate sauce, chocolate or vanilla. And then after that, uh, in the British manner, a savory, a, um, a pear, some roe for cheese, Stilton, which he loved best, and... Let, let him see that the brandy was right there. Then he would have been happy. And then everybody else would have been happy, too. Sita Stelzer, she's an author, freelance journalist, and research associate at the Hudson Institute. The book is Dinner with Churchill, Policy Making at the Dinner Table. It's published by Pegasus Books. Sita, thanks so much for being on the program. Thank you. It was fun. The Churchill Center is a global organization educating new generations on the leadership, statesmanship, vision, and courage of Winston Churchill. The center is partnering with the George Washington University to create the new National Churchill Library and Center in the heart of Washington. The facility will be at the university's Gelman Library and will include a library of books written by and about Churchill, rotating exhibits, and space for seminars. An endowed professorship in Churchill and British Studies will also be created as part of this partnership.